Okay, so how does Ophelia, or why is Ophelia's uh, original DYT incorrect? Didn't they derive it in a times 2x dx dt. Chain rule says we got to we got to multiply by the derivative of the inside function. The inside oh. function here is x. Okay. x is a function of t. x being probably well, this is kind of out of context. It doesn't have a problem that's associated with. But uh, let's assume x is like the position function. It's, it tells you where the, poly, the, the particle or the whatever is in space. Um, and it's a function of t. As time goes on, the position will change as a direct result of time passing by. So it's a function of t, and so we need to multiply by the derivative of x with respect to t. That's exactly what dx dt is. Okay, next. chain rule when taking the derivative with respect to a different variable? To make everything To make everything what? To make everything Why can't we just say that the derivative of x squared is 2x? Why do we have to use a chain rule on this thing? Because it's not respect to x. Time is changing. Yeah. 
you're getting there. You're not using the exact math words I'm looking for, but yeah, you're getting there. So you got as time changes, yeah? It's not respect to change x. It's not respect to x, it's with respect to t. There's something even <coughs> more what's just that like the right of x word for square root four? It's like it's explicit. What? Is it explicit? It is implicit. It's not implicit. What's not explicit? It is implicit, but it's, it's implicit. Is implicit. Of yeah. what? It's Something's implied? Yeah. What's implied? It's that it's a function of t. Function. That it's a function of t. It's a it's implied that the thing we're taking the derivative of is a function of t, that t directly changes whatever it is, in this case, x. It changes x directly. Okay, that's why. Because, because <laughs> it's implied that uh, the variable, whatever it is, Because it can be applied to any situation. It's not always x, and it's not always t. A lot of times it is, but it's not always x. So we'll just say <coughs> x, right? To stand in the place of the variable that's a function of the other thing, and t to stand in the place of the thing that it's a function of. Okay. You good? See how this works? Nothing. I won't get stuck right at the end of this one. As far as. stuck here on this problem? Yeah, I get stuck basically looking at it going, okay, I know I have to plug in here. I know, for example, I have 2x is 2, well, 2x minus x, and I have 2x is 2, but I don't know how to get the like, initial thing, so that's when I get stuck. This initial derivative? Well, yeah, like, even before that, though, like, the, like, since I have 2y dt, that yeah. equals 2 times 2x minus 2, like, I just... Well, this is a pretty bare bones example here, just that there is a function y, and it is equal to, uh, uh, you know, the other side of it is comprised of an expression with x in it, um, and that both sides need to, be, need to have the derivative taken with respect to t. So we take the derivative of the left side, that is dy dt, there's, there's nothing to it. It is the derivative of y with respect to t. The way in which y is changing as t is changing is given by the derivative of the right side. And we take the derivative of the right side with respect to t. Okay. So where is it that you're, like you were saying, you know you're supposed to plug things in, but you're not sure of, and I, I'm well, not sure I'm applying to you. Taking um, the derivative of a function of x and y, like I get that you can just take the derivative of y if, well, depending on the get how to do that, like I know how to work that out from there, but like I don't know how to get the first part, like how to take the three parts of the question and like piece them into one thing. Okay. Um, let's see. Well, Let's wait until maybe we have a like the next one where we actually have words to go along with it. Well, I get it words a little bit better. Like I just flip this off one, I can uh, see the height is changing okay. when the height is changing, the volume is changing. Uh -huh. uh -huh. But when it's like just words, well, letters. Well, when it's just letters, it's just more confusing. All we need to realize is that we're not taking the derivative uh, with respect to x like we're used to. Like this person, as, as Aaron said, took the derivative with respect to x. Right. That, that is the derivative with respect to x, but the thing we need is with respect to t. So that would be like the y. The x wouldn't be in the of like the y. It'd be kind of like y when we're taking the derivative implicitly. But how do we know what's in the second term? It says so that it would be. Well, it says so, right? The, the fact that it says dy dt, that's how you know. Um, 
and dx to t. Is the value of that variable t is there given in the instructions? That's how you know. All right. Okay. I mean, it could be with respect to something else, but as far as related rates go, time is the thing that makes the most sense. Time is going by, things are changing, because time is changing. Um, yeah, but it could, I mean, we could just be talking about a, a graph of three axes, a three-dimensional axis, an x, a y, and a z, where z is changing, because z is, might as well call it time. still confused, just we'll work one-on-one -on -one and, and uh, get that cleared up if, if, the, if that's needed still. Okay, so this person worked this problem incorrectly. Um, so why is it incorrect for grading to put 6 or 24, for that matter, in for R in the area formula? Because this is um, two different problems, right? A and B. So different colors, different problems. So here, found the area formula. Probably a useful thing to know, since it's talking about area, and it's talk, talk, talking about radius. Yeah. Uh, so it finds the area formula, plugs in the radius, and then gets this. And so let's just go to this step right here. Why is it incorrect for gradient to put 6 or 24 into the area formula? Is that a helpful a problem? Now we bring it up. It happens all the time. People want to do it. Let's write it down real quick. Take a few you know, personal moments yourself meditate on it. There's a there's more than one mistake here. That's the first one that's what we're talking about. very common thing that students want to do. They're going to get the formula, or the initial formula, and then plug in all this information and then get what comes out of it. All right? So why, why is that messing everything up? Why is that not the right thing to do? Because it didn't derive the whole thing. Okay, why is that a problem? Not taking the derivative before you do that. Drive it, there's no exponent. I mean, like the two positive Uh huh. Uh, okay. Mm. Okay. It does makes you do different things. Okay. Um, I think good. Good. Anybody got? Yeah. Any comments? It depends on my character. plug in the radius at the at the stage of the problem where you just have the area formula, all that number tells you is the area. And if we, it's like we stop it. We, we don't allow it to change. Does that make sense? We just stop it right at, at six centimeters, the radius is six centimeters, and we don't allow the radius to change. And therefore, we don't really allow the area to change. And so when we go to take the derivative there in that last step, dA dt is really meaningless. Big misunderstanding there as well. But if we plug a specific value in for r at the stage where what we should do here is do what? Well, we should find the change, which means we need to take the derivative. If we want to know about rate of change of anything, we're talking about derivative and calculus. Okay, so if we want to find the rate of change of the area, which is affected by the rate of change of the radius, we need to have those involved in some kind of an equation which would require us to take the derivative. So if we plug in a value of r in the stage we're supposed to take the derivative, we're not allowing r to change. r has stopped and has become constant. It is not going to change when we take the derivative. Okay. So 
guess in a kind of a, it's not exactly right, but it, I think it conveys what we're trying to say. It uh, stops R <coughs> from changing. Just you mean A? And A. Oh. It stops R and A, for that matter. stops uh, R and A from changing. The only reason I said R is because it, it definitely stops R from changing if you were to have, say, more variables a more, and a more involved problem, then, uh, then yeah, it, it does effectively, it's gonna change, it's gonna stop the other thing from changing because it, it's not true to the scenario. I just wanted to specify where you changed the state. By the, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. It does affect that. It, what it directly does, though, is stops R, which stops A. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so Ray D's second mistake is taking the derivative in the last step, or is in taking the derivative in the last step. So say you did have this as a function you wanted to take the derivative of. It's almost a completely different problem, not related to rate, related rates at all. It seems to be a related rates problem when he put six in for R. But uh, let's say he took the derivative in the last step uh, what what would be the derivative of 36 pi? Zero. Zero. Because what's pi? It's a constant number. And the derivative of a constant, right? A constant times another constant is just a constant. So zero would be the derivative. Just bring that up because I've seen it lots of times, right? You're choosing pi as this variable. And you take the derivative and you just call it 36. Oof, so many problems with that. Uh, we're going too fast, I think. Not, not paying attention, not thinking about it. You, even if pi were a variable, we're taking the derivative with respect to t, right? So that it's also pi. Yeah? So how do we know when to take a derivative to what? Like, how do we know in this problem that we need to take it to respect, <coughs> with respect to t instead of respect to a or r? Because the, you do have to discern what information it's giving you. One thing I'll tell you is that it's almost always with respect to time, because our brains function that way, and we've been trained to think that way. Physics to, I don't know, just math classes, we talk about speed and velocity, and all these things are with respect to time, right? These things are changing every hour, every minute, every second, right? It's always with respect to time, not always, but a lot of times it is. Um, the, like, in, in the problem, in the equation, you know that dr dt, to speak in calculus terms, is going to be involved. How do we know that dr dt is going to be involved? What in this, what in this problem tells us dr dt is going to be involved? So we're going to have a point that's increasing at a rate that's increasing in rates. So that's like t. Well, the rate, it's not exactly the rate, but that helps us. That really tells us that it's uh, increasing, changing. It's another word for, it's a specific word for changing. Now that's something you have to plug in. You can't ignore the three. You can't ignore the three. Yeah, that's another thing where it's like, I just know I made a mistake somewhere because where, where does the three come yeah. in? Um, but it's got, a, it's got a rate of change tells us the derivative is involved. But it's the per minute yeah. that tells us that the rate of change is with respect to time. It could say per foot or per radian or per degree or per anything really, um, those would be odd though. See what I'm saying? These are strange things to say it's changing with respect to. Um, so it's this per minute that tells us, well, it's going to be, the change is changing because time is changing, not because the angle is changing or because of anything else, but because the, the uh, time is passing by. So the, rate, uh, the radius is changing at a rate that's with respect to time. So you know dr dt is going to be involved. So it's a, at least a safe bet that dA dt is going to be involved. And we can see when it says find the rates of change of area, um, we're going to assume that we mean also with respect to time. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. All right. Last one. This one's done correctly, and I want you to Number tell me. Ingredient. Huh? What? Number one ingredient: goldfish and smile. What, really? Yeah. What is? Smile. Goldfish, first ingredient. Okay. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so, really, I like so <laughs> how did Marla find 
the equation for volume, right? Either this or this. Yeah, how do you find the equation for volume? I want you to write that down. Great job, Marla. She knew this, and she knew that, and she noticed this and that. If you if it were a well let's say not a cube but like a box it would be length times which which we say width times height times width depth or length or whatever you want to call it right so if this were not a, a triangular prism as Ryan said but a, a, a rectangular prism or a box then we would just do height times width times and by length I mean the you know the depth into the board here. But it's not a box, a rectangular box. It's a triangular one. And since the triangle takes up half of the space that the rectangle is going to be inside, it's one half base times height, right? A rectangle would be base times height. A triangle would be one half of base times height. Okay? So since the surface area of this triangle is one half base times height, and the same idea holds true for all kinds of prism shapes. You just find the surface area and multiply by the distance that you're extruding that shape along. Okay, anything. A triangle, go like that, find the surface area, multiply it by, say, the length. Uh, this weird shape, right? If you're just extruding it along this straight line. That was beautiful. Wow. Then you take the surface area. That so good. Multiply it by the length. <coughs> it's incredible. Can you tell why the a squared is because w equals eight? What? Yes, well, because yeah. if you notice, at, at this particular point in time, they're giving us the measurements like, well, actually of the trough, okay? Three feet across, three feet tall. That's like the, the maximum potential of the of the trough. But any at any level, the triangle that that the face of it makes is going to be similar to the triangle that we have here, which means the proportions would be the same, which means that if this base equals this height, then the base of any triangle that's inside this trough, would, the base and the height would be the same. Now what would happen if the roof is longer, like large portion of the length? Then in that case, they're going to give us something to, to get us, a relationship between the height and the base. They would say the height is twice as much as the base, or whatever. They're going to say something like that, uh, or find a way to find that information. Any information? Because you couldn't. Well, to make this problem fairly easy to approach and to solve, they don't want too many variables to be involved. If it was uh, base times height, 
Then we got the base, and we have to do derivative of a, a base of title as a product. We have to use the product rule. And it's going to be applied to all entities. Lots of information. They say, did it tell us something about the relationship between the base and the height? Okay. Does that make sense? There's going to be some way to find that relationship between the base and the height. Okay. Um, and it's a simple one here. The base and the height are just the same. If this is three, and if this is three, then any triangle in here, the base and the height are going to be equal to each other. So she notices that base must be equal to height. So base times height is just height squared. Right? Why, why write height squared, h squared, instead of base squared? What would be the point? Well, oh, well we, could, we could re realize that, hey, it's going to be the same anyway. But also, yeah. The reason why she chose height is that she reads along here um, how fast the water level rising, the height of the triangle rising, changing. Okay. So she interprets that from the question. She knows from the question that she's going to know something about the height. In this case, if we did read or age, it'd be the exact same thing. But if uh, the base was twice as big as the height, be careful, you want to choose the correct variable. So when we take the derivative, what we're solving for is the rate of change of the thing you're asking about. Does that make sense? I'm just saying a lot of words. Cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of words that make sense? Okay, Maybe. good. Maybe? A lot of words, some of them make sense. Oh. I'm just talking about, well, how about a squared? Does that make any sense? Yes. Yes. Okay, let's go back. Volume equals surface area times the length, right? So the surface area of this triangle is, well, of, of any triangle, one half base times height. So one half base times height times 12, because it's 12 feet back. Okay? Um, let's just say base times height. Okay? And the only difference between this and this is that we notice that B and H are the same. Because the full trough, the whole trough, is three feet across, that's the base. We're looking oh, at it kind of upside down, right? And here's the height is also three feet. So any other smaller triangle will be proportional to that, and mm -hmm. base and height will be the same. That makes sense. Okay. Um, and so 12 times 1 half is 6, so 6h squared. All right. So uh, ooh, there's lots of reasons. pictures, right, because she knows that to find the volume of something like this, you just take the surface area and multiply it by the length. Uh, so she knows the surface area is one half base times height. She also knows that base and height are the same. So B times H becomes H times H, and then H squared. There we are. Um, so how does Marla know? So she takes the derivative of that, right? How does Marla know that DBDT should be 2? Right? So she has DBDT, and uh, she has 2 times 2 minus. So just quickly write that down. Her own self, can you explain it to yourself? Can you explain it to another person? Can you die again? Cubic, it says the cubic feet uh, per minute is two cubic feet per minute. So well, why is that dBdt? What does dBdt have to do with three cubic feet or two cubic feet per second? The rate of volume is increasing. The rate of volume is increasing. So <coughs> dBdt is the rate of change of volume during each cycle time. How fast is the volume changing? It could be increasing or decreasing, depending on whether water is flowing in or flowing out. Uh, how fast the volume is changing. Since the volume is getting more, it's increasing, so dBd2 would be a, a positive value. Okay?
changing at one sixth of a flip per minute. But one split second after that is not changing at that rate. Is it changing quick, more quickly or more slowly? More slowly. More slowly, because now we're we've got more surface area at the top of the at the surface of the water to like accept all that volume, and it's not going to change vertically as much. Okay. Y'all experienced that before in real life? Before in a glass, and y'all put something in the glass is tapered up or yeah. out, I guess. What's that? Some kind of a smart alley from Mark over there. Uh, we're pouring it in there. And it fills up really fast, and once it gets to the top, it kind of slows down. Uh, but you're not slowing down how fast you pour it in. Um, I don't know what the better example is. coming out of the funnel at the bottom at the same rate, but it's moving really slowly, and then once it gets down to the bottom, it just kind of disappears really fast. You need to bring the tub. You need to bring the tub. Then, like, when it's like that, you can start. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a, like, so it's all pretty uniform as, it, as, it, as it's deep, but then once it gets down really, uh, not very deep, really shallow, it's like faster and faster. Yeah, it's slow, and so the, the surface area is changing, and there's you get it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, questions about that or about another homework problem? 46. 46. Control car is parked 50 feet from a long warehouse. Here, let's uh, put it, bring in the picture of that. This asking me to kind of show about how smart I am and how good my TA is. She went out hunting in a dress. Yeah, she came in with a dress. Yeah, she came in with a that for us, 50 feet, a long warehouse. Why? Uh, what? Uh, there was a Josie there. You see what happened? He parked oh, so uh, Kendra and Josie were out there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> the revolving line on top of the car, <laughs> which is <laughs> totally what cop cars look like nowadays. It's true. Uh, 30 revolutions per minute. How fast is the light beam moving along the wall when the beam makes angles of 60 degrees, 60 degrees, 70 degrees? So they're thinking of how to evade cop like cars. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. Are you sure? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so here's the thing. The, the thing we know is how fast this is spinning around. That's at a constant rate, and they're giving us that the angle is changing at a, at that rate. Okay. With respect to time. As the 
as the light moves along the wall, how would you say, how fast would you say the light is moving along the wall here as compared to way out here? Lower. Slower, Lower here, yeah. much faster here. Yeah. It's almost like this Zeno's paradox. Do you know Zeno's paradox? No. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I should ask if you remember, because I told you about it. Mm -hmm. no. So, uh, the cave. The cave? No. No, Zeno's paradox is uh, in the race between Achilles and a tortoise. Mm -hmm. And the tortoise gets a head start, and it runs out, you know, let's say five meters in front of Achilles. And so here's uh, Achilles here. Let me get on the screen. Achilles, and the tortoise has a head start, so he's up here, okay? So let's mark that. He's there, and the tortoise is there. So the tortoise is moving very slowly. He didn't get one line. What? On the screen. He didn't get one line. Oh, on the screen. Okay, so then the tortoise, the, you know, Archimedes takes off. Okay, but by the time, or sorry, Achilles, he wasn't very fast. By the time Achilles gets there, the tortoise has moved. Okay, and so now let's mark those positions. All right, and now Achilles is still headed towards the tortoise. The tortoise, by the time Achilles gets there, has moved again. Okay, so Achilles is here. And now Achilles still moving, moves towards the tortoise. Tortoise now moves a little bit more, and Achilles has moved a little bit more, but the tortoise has moved by the time he gets to where the tortoise used to be. So if he gets to where he used to be, then. Okay, and so he just keeps getting to where the tortoise used to be, and it seems looking at it this way, and he never gets there, and it's, it's like, this, this light just keeps going faster and faster and faster along this wall. And but then, like, how fast does the light have to be going before it it gets to such an angle that it's not shining on the wall anymore? Wall or if it was going straight out, it wouldn't be a wall. It'd be like a line that was going like this going on the wall, right? Yeah. You had some light wrapped around. Like, if it was pointing like straight, then it wouldn't be doing that. It wouldn't be what? It wouldn't be doing that. The wall. Assuming it is, okay. assuming it is, it is forever and ever long. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? No, it just seems like <laughs> the speed will increase more and more and more as the as the the light angles this way more and more and more. And like, oh, yeah. sorry. What, what what happens when the light eventually? Does not shine on the wall anymore. Does it become parallel? Oh. I don't know, but like, it's how does it finally come off of the wall? It turns up. I don't think it's like stuck to the wall. You can't see it because light can't travel that far. Light travels forever. Our eyes limit us. Sometimes I ask questions and it seems like students don't care about it or they get angry. Or they don't. They don't quite get why this is so such a strange way to think about it. Because if I think about the wall going off for this wall goes on forever and I'm shining like a laser beam at it, and if the laser beam goes on forever, the light goes on forever. Like I can shine my laser so it doesn't shine on the wall. I can shine it this yeah. way, right? Yeah. But once it gets parallel, point. but I turn it one half a degree that way. And it'll hit. And, and at some point way wall. off in infinity, yeah. they the laser will hit the wall. So the like wall what does it's it look like when that way. light finally comes? Off the wall. It seems like it never can. It seems like it is stuck to the wall. Animal. No, when they're very well, it's conical, though. When it hits its limit. I, I haven't even really thought about it. Like how it's fast? Way way how so you're how fast is it going just before it comes off the wall? I feel like you're just trying to confuse us. Nah. <laughs> All right, here we go. What you get? But what you get is the idea of what's going on here. This is spinning around, and this light is moving along the wall, and that rate is changing. In that discussion, you get that. Like something that's much more way out there, you get the idea of what's going on. Like if it moves like five degrees, it's moving more heat than the last five degrees. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So the thing that, that is constant, that is controlling this whole scenario, is how fast this thing is spinning around and around and around. Okay. So they're asking about, basically, they've got it marked out here, how, how, 
quickly is X changing? That's definitely part of the question. Um, and what they're giving us, the information they're giving us about what's affecting all this change is this light and how many degrees it, uh, or how many revolutions it can go through in, what, a minute or a second? In a minute. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> so they're giving us revolutions, but then they're asking, like, when it's 30 degrees or when it's 60 degrees or whatever. Okay. So we have to figure something about that. So can we find a relationship apparently between the angle, between the angle and this distance? Well, we can find the angle by just going 360 degrees in one minute. Uh -huh. uh, we can find like just the speed at which it's rotating from that. In degrees. In degrees. Okay, how many degrees per minute is it going? 30. 30 degrees? No. 30 revolutions of 360 degrees each? Yeah. It goes 360 every two seconds. 10,800 degrees per minute? Wow. It's 30. It's 30. It's 30 over 2 per minute. Well, let's stick with per minute because that's what, that's what they're giving us. All right? Oh. Okay, so 10,800 degrees per minute. Can you make it smaller? Well, I'm saying we're going to stay in minutes just because that's what they're starting in. And you know, if we were to check our answer, at the very least justification, if we check our answer, it would probably be in per minute. Okay. Well, there's, what is this? That is the rate of current change. Change the rate of change. And change the time for dx, dt, dt. Very good, d theta dt is what we have here. Now, if that ever becomes part of an equation, we'll have it. Can we find a relationship? First, to find the, the rate of change of something, you have to find like how to measure it in a, in a picture, right? Just in a frozen moment in time, you have to be able to measure the angle or find the relationship between this angle and this distance. Is there a relationship between that angle and that distance? Yeah. What is it? So, which one? Well, what would be, yeah, okay, so the tangent would be, the tangent of theta would be what? X over 50. X over 50. Well, that seems good, right? 50 is, a, is something that's constant, it's not changing. If you were to use the hypotenuse, would that be a good idea? No. The hypotenuse also is changing, because we don't want that. Okay. Uh, okay, so theta is changing, uh, and so that's affecting how X is changing, so what do we need to do? Let's do the inverse, inverse or what should we say the derivative? The inverse tangent is what do we want to find out? Of what? Inverse. Nope, no, no, no. The derivative. Let's all calm down. The change in x is the change in theta. Derivative. We want the rate of change of x. Dx dt. Dx dt. So a good Maybe x alone. Get x alone. Yeah. So rather than having to do all that inverse stuff, we we decide. Well, we want dx dt. Whatever this is, is whatever it is, right? It's just it's good looking or bad looking. It's just going to be what it is. This is what we want to know the rate of change of. Okay. So should we put in thirty degrees right now? No. No. We need to take the derivative so that theta can change. If we plug oh, in a, a specific yeah. value for theta, it won't be able to change. So dx over dt. So dx over dt is fifty. What? Squared, remember that one? Yeah, yeah. Squared theta. I knew that. Yeah. Anything else? Uh, oh, theta prime. Yeah. Oh, d theta dt. Yeah. So if we know theta and we know d theta dt at, at some moment, then we'll know how fast the light is moving along the wall. Okay? Is that? There's d theta dt. But we need to know theta. So What's theta, theta when when thirty? Well, it's thirty degrees. It's pretty yeah. easy, right? Mm -hmm. so What's theta when when the angle is thirty degrees? Just wrong. That's a silly question. We plug in 
50 times the secant of the secant squared of 30 degrees times the theta to t, which is 10,800 degrees per minute. What's the cosine of 30 degrees? It is a square root of 3 over 2. Great job, Kendra. Squared, right? Secant squared. This is the, or sorry, what we should have is, is the reciprocal, because that's the secant squared, times 10,800. So here we have 50 times 4 over 3 is 10,800. This is divisible by 3. That's good to know. What's the reciprocal thing? This. How did you know that? I just added 100. Oh, right. That's the good old. 10,800 uh, times 4 thirds. Times 50. Did I do something wrong? Uh, if you don't do four thirds, it'll divide it. Oh, wait, so if you have to put four thirds into it. Multiply by four thirds, then. Uh, no. It, it respects the order of operations and it does everything from left to right. So first multiply this by four, then divide by three, which would be the same thing. Because if I did 10,800 over one times four over three, it would do just that. If you put it in parentheses, so, well, what do you say? It's, yeah, it's dx, right? What unit is x in? Feet. Feet. How do we know it's in feet? It's because it's changing. Because it tells us feet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does. 50 feet from 50 feet, feet right? It, it, what's, what's giving our linear measure, or, or giving us information in this equation about linear measure is 50 feet, right? If it was whatever centimeters or whatever, then we'd be talking about centimeters. Um, here we can we can see it here, fifty feet, right? Mm -hmm. Fifty feet, okay. Um, what's the the secant of thirty is going to be in what? Degrees. No, thirty is in degrees. When you take the secant of that, it's just a number. It's just a ratio of a sign of, of one side to another side, right? So it's just a number. Um, so feet times a number times degrees per minute uh, is going to give us feet degrees per minute. Feet degrees per minute. Feet degrees. I think we talked about this like weeks ago. I think we yeah. talked about this all before. I'm not saying anything. What degree <laughs> was like the movement of yeah. 720,000. Degrees. Should have been doing do the radians. No. Should have done radians. Because radians, radians is a true measure of the actual like proportions of the part of the circumference to the radius. It's an actual like ratio between two things. The degrees is kind of arbitrary. We're just saying let's take a full revolution divided into 360. I should have seen that. So not 10,800 degrees per minute, but we're going to talk about radians per minute. How many radians would that be? Good Q, good Q. <laughs> we're going to translate degrees into radians and multiply by the 360, so it'd be 2 pi. Okay, 2 pi times 30. 2 pi times 30. 
pi. So 60 pi per minute. Pick up a calculator. Is This is a no. This would be whatever needs to be a degrees or radians. What is that for times radians? Or is it well, if we choose just the radius, this would just be pi over three, oh. pi over six. Oh. But then the secant of that would be the same as the secant of thirty degrees. Okay. Um, So what do we get feet per minute? Let's just go ahead and multiply these together. I mean, this should have been that 100 times over by now. It's what? Check it. If I'm wrong, let me know. Wait, so you don't put radians in the Um, no, because so here's the difference between degrees and radians. Um, degrees. It's just let's take the full revolution and divide it into 360 pieces arbitrarily. We could just as easily divide it into 40 pieces or 300 pieces, or and there are. Uh, measures of angles that are based on 300 units per revolution or whatever. But radians is a true ratio, just like secant is a ratio, or sine is a ratio, or tangent is just a ratio of one side to another. Radian is a ratio of the, uh, the like portion of the circumference that we're looking at versus the radius of that circle. So it's just a ratio of two measures of how big the circle is. Right? Uh, so it's just a ratio of the, the portion of the circumference to the, uh, to the radius. Right? And so because of that, it's just a true measurement of how far around the circle you are, taking into account how big the circle is. Right? If you see the circumference is five, well, or, or the, the arc is five, if it's got a small radius, that could be the whole circumference. If it's got an even smaller radius, that arc could be several times around the circle. If it's got a big radius, that same five could just be barely around the circle at all. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. And that's what a radian is. It just measures the ratio, or it is a, a, a ratio of sorts, comparing the bigness of the circumference to the bigness of the radius. Okay? It's just a ratio of one piece to another. And therefore, the units would be canceled. And it doesn't have any call them radians. Okay. So when we say 60 pi, we're, we're saying it's gotten this far around the circle, but in like a true, in a 
true way. It kind of doesn't have you instead of back to the kingdom. Okay. okay. So the answer, the short answer is no. We don't have to worry about the radius like we did for years. Okay. Here, it's 4,000 pi feet per minute. Um, how many feet would that be per second? That's a lot. And then if we're just going down to second, that should be less feet <laughs> per second. We're going to get that. <coughs> just this by 60? And the pi. Oh, and, and the pi? No. Um, well, this is, if we go this many feet in a minute, then we should go 1 60th of this in a second. Just divide 4,000 by 60. Also plug in 60 degrees, 70 degrees, just as easily. So, listen, jerks. What about what about when this is 90 degrees? It won't be touching the wall. It won't be touching the wall, and so what's going to happen to this? It's not going to happen. Why? Because the secret of 90 is zero. No, it's not touching the wall. Well, the secret of 90 isn't zero, but the cosine of zero of 90 is zero. Oh, yeah. Um, it's undefined. Oh, yeah. It's undefined. But any value less than 90? So more than 90 is like anywhere from like 90 to like. Anywhere from 90, yeah. Top part, even 80 would be undefined. 180, even or all the way around. So we'd have to go all the way back around 360 before we got back. Well, no, okay. What about on the other side of the triangle? 270, yeah. Yeah, because on the other side. It could be on the other side. Okay, yeah. Nice. 90 to 270, or 180 oh, degrees away from 90. Anyway, more questions? No, senor. I don't know what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah,